Hi everyone, today we'll be learning about the history of the periodic table. And we'll be starting off with the historical development of the periodic table. Now let's look at the evolution of the periodic table in the sense how our understanding of atoms increased and as a result we were able to relate an atom to an element. Now today we know what an atom and element is and also their differences and their similarities. So what's an atom? An atom makes up an element. So one kind of atom, but lots of it, makes up one element. Further, we were able to draw up relationships between elements. In other words, we were able to see how two different elements had something in common and how two different elements had something in difference. First, we'll be looking at Antoine Lavoisier. He classified the known elements into metals and non-metals. So in the periodic table today, we know that towards our left stands the non-metals and towards our right stands the non-metals. So there we go. And he based the classifications on physical and chemical properties. Now some physical properties would be the boiling point and the melting point. And you know that non-metals have a quite low melting and boiling point, while metals have a quite high melting and boiling point and these are the similarities in terms of their physical properties. Now thinking of, about the chemical properties, now this is reactivity. We know non-metals such as the noble gases which is in a group 8, argon gas, helium gas, they have chemical properties which show that they're inert gases, in other words they don't react at all. But what about the gases that do react and also the elements that react, for example our metals, they are quite reactive, especially sodium and potassium, which are group 1 elements. So you can see how physical and chemical properties are defined and also how they determine metallic and non-metallic properties of an element. Then came Dobrina. Now he worked in 1829 to group elements into triads and this was based on also chemical and phys uh, chemical and physical properties. So some of the triads here we have sulfur, selenium and trillenium and then we have chlorine, bromine and iodine. If you notice all these they're, in, they're from the same group in your modern periodic table. So if you grab your periodic table right now you'll be able to see that all these elements here, the three here, they're from the same group and that's how he was able to make up a triad. Next came John Newlands. What he proposed was called the law of octates. And there he arranged the table of elements into eight columns and seven rows. It was arranged in the order of atom increasing atomic weight. Now we know what the atomic weight is. If you just look in your little square in the periodic table and just below the chemical formula, you would find the atomic weight and it differs from element to element. In the modern periodic table, it is not grouped from increasing atomic weight. So especially around copper, you would find that there is no trend in increasing atomic weight. But Newlands here, he was able to group them according to increasing atomic weight. So our modern periodic table does not look like Newlands periodic table. Now the law of octaves which he proposed stated that every eight elements starting from a given one has similar chemical and physical properties. In other words, every eight element would have the same physical and chemical properties. Now this is what his periodic table looked like. So as you can see, he had seven rows going down like that and he had three columns but actually eight of them, so like that. So eight and then what he did was he grouped each of them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the eighth one here would have the same chemical properties. So hydrogen, fluorine, and chlorine would have the same chemical and physical properties according to him. So that's how he did it. So you would notice um, the chemical symbol here, G. Now G doesn't exist in our, our periodic table today. But these were the names he gave and also what existed in those days. So this is purely his periodic table. 
Initially, the Chemical Society ridiculed his ideas. By 1887, they realized a group breaking the groundbreaking importance of his ideas. And today, we take some of his skills to make our periodic table. So this was a basis of the modern periodic table, as you can see. Next came Dmitri Mendeleev. Now Mendeleev, he arranged familiar and related elements in vertical groups. So going down like that, and he also uh, proposed a periodic law. Now in his periodic law he said, the properties of elements vary periodically with their atomic weight properties. So for example, elements that go according to periods, in other words rows, they vary, while grouped elements have similar chemical properties. Now Mendeleev's success. He was able to predict the properties of undiscovered elements. Now this was a great discovery because he was a, we have not discovered many elements at that time, but he was able to predict the chemical properties of such using the periodic table. So any uh, element that was around it made a contribution to the undiscovered elements. So for example, he predicted that the echo silicon in 1871 proved to be close match to properties of geranium. Geranium is now uh, discovered and it was discovered 15 years later after his proposal here. And he used to call it echo silicon, like that. Now as you can see, this was Mendeleev's periodic table. As opposed to Newland's periodic table, this is much more complex. And also you can see it's much more similar to our modern periodic table without the block in the middle. That's our transition metals. So as you can see, we have eight groups going down. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight. And then we have five rows going down like that. And it takes a step-like structure like that and we have hydrogen at the top up there and every other element. As you can see, this is a mixture of our transition metals as well as the metals that you can see today. But he also had some question marks like these. These were the undiscovered elements that he thought would fit in these places. So for example, he would th think that this block here, group three, row four, would have two elements that have similar chemical properties to that of aluminium, boron, and iodine, so like that. Now the classification of elements, Lothar Mayer, he published similar scheme to Mendeleev for the classification of the elements. So he worked very similarly to Mendeleev and he arranged the elements in increasing atomic mass and placed them in grouped bases on their combining power and valency, the number of bonds an element can form. Now these are very two important keywords that you should remember about Mayer. He used the concept of combining power and valency. What are these two? Today we really do learn about this. Combining power is its reactivity. How easy can it combine with another one and its power? Valency, valency we refer to today as how many electrons it can give or take in. So the atomic mass, he placed, he um, arranged the, them in order of increasing atomic mass and placed them in grouped base. So any, um, any two elements that have the same combining power were in the same group. He plotted the graphs of physical and physical properties against atomic mass and it looked like this. So for example, you can see that lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium and cesium have quite high atomic volume against its atomic mass. So its volume to mass ratio is quite high. And because these are all group one elements, if you can remember, they don't have one electron in its outer shell. They only have one electron. That means for that period, it has quite less mass in comparison to its volume. And if you look at just the dips here, they're all the elements, beryllium, aluminium, cobalt, and stuff, those are from group three, or surrounding that area. But it is important to know that this cesium, rubidium, potassium, 
sodium and lithium are all group 1 elements because they only have one electron in their outer shell. However, they still have that shell, which means their volume is going to be large, but their mass isn't. Now, the mass isn't determined on the electron because electrons have a negligible mass. But what is it based on? Because they're all neutral atoms, they're going to have the same number of protons. So the number of protons they have is quite low in comparison when you're comparing it against their period. So that's why they have quite a large volume in comparison to their mass. Now Mosley, Henry Mosley, he proposed the concept of atomic number. Now atomic number was quite new and it was proposed in 1913. The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. Now this, this you have already learned, but it was only discovered in 1913, which is quite recent. So the number of protons determine the number of uh, the atomic number. So in a neutral atom, the number of electrons would equal the number of protons. Now what that means is that because it's not charged, it does not have any excess number of electrons or an excess number of protons. Now it is also important to know that every, at every element has a different atomic number. So the atomic number is unique to each element, which means the number of electrons or protons are very unique. The atomic numbers determined the chemical properties of an element. So it is important that you know your atomic number because that was a highly determined, it determined what the chemical properties of that element would be. Now just summing up what we learned this lesson, we, took, we looked at a few different periodic tables during the historical period, how it first started and how they enhanced their knowledge throughout the years. Now let's just look at some questions. We have question one. It's a multiple choice question. It asks, which of the following sets of elements would Dobrina have recognized as a triad? If you remember, Dobrina's triad, all the elements in a triad would come from the same group. So if you just look, we have lithium, beryllium, and boron. We know that all three elements are from different groups. So it can't be B because they're not from the same group. Now C, we have oxygen, sulfur, and arsenic. Their arsenic is in group 5, while oxygen and sulfur are in group 7. So clearly, arsenic would disrupt the triad. So C is incorrect. We have D, which is Fr, radium, and actinium. All three elements are from different groups. So this is incorrect as well. Looking at A, we have lithium, sodium, and potassium. Now we know that all three are from group 1, they're all group 1 elements, so they must be the triad. So A is the answer. Now questions 2, it says name the scientist who first introduced the periodic table. Now this is quite easy. Now if you just flip back to your notes or your memory, you can remember it's Dmitri Mendeleev. So as you can see, Dmitri Mendeleev would be the answer. So this just simply says to name and it will be worth one mark. So you just write the name like that. Question 3. The periodic table we use today has been modified from that of Mendeleev. Compare the old periodic law put forward by Mendeleev to the modern periodic law put forward by Henry Mosley. Now just remember it says compare. So for that kind of question you can do it in dot points or paragraphs or you can use two tables. So with compare, you would have to look at the similarities and the differences of the two periodic tables. Looking at first Mosley, he stated that the modern periodic law, which states that elements show a repeating pattern or periodicity of properties when they were placed in order of increasing atomic number. Now note Mosley used atomic number. That's the significance of his proposal. While Mendeleev's periodic uh, law is based on atomic mass. Now this is a comparison where you would compare Mosley and Mendeleev. What were their bases in the periodic table? Me Mosley based it on atomic number, while Mendeleev based it on atomic mass. So that's the difference. While they both proposed the periodic table, that's the similarity. Now question four. 
John Newlands made an important contribution as he was the first scientist to attempt to use a sequence of atomic masses to organize elements. Describe the sequence proposed by Newlands. So, you would have to describe it in step by step or just a paragraph. Law of octaves. Now, this is his proposal. This is his uh, law. If the elements were placed in order of increasing atomic mass, then a repetition of properties would occur every eighth element, like the octave in music. So, in other words, what happens is every eighth element would have similar properties. Question 5. Evaluate the usefulness of Newland's law of octaves using the data in the table. So you are given a table here and law of octaves, if you remember, is that every eighth element would have the same chemical and physical properties. So if you look here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that means all the elements in each group like that would have the same chemical physical properties. Now we're supposed to evaluate the usefulness. In other words, what we have to do is to see how this is similar to today's periodic table. There is some periodicity as some groups do, do seem to correspond. For example, we have hydrogen, fluorine and chlorine in the same group are all gaseous non-metals. Lithium, sodium and potassium are all metals with a valency of 1. That's our second group there. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium are all metals with a valency of 2. So as you can see, they do have something in common. However, the last two groups do not fit together. Example, we have nitrogen and phosphorus that are non-metals, whereas we have manganese, which is a metal. Now these have nothing in common, so clearly this second last column here, it doesn't fit in properly. We have oxygen and uh, sulfur, which are non-metals, while we have iron up there, which is a metal. So clearly these two columns there don't fit in properly and don't correspond to the modern periodic table. This classification is of little value for grouping elements, as it does not always provide grouping of similar elements. So here we are saying that this classification is of little value. Yes, it does provide some good information here, but in when it gets to here, it gets a bit, um, it's not very consistent. So it's of little value for grouping um, elements. Now this line here, this is quite important when you're writing an evaluation. This is what you call your evaluation statement. And when it says to evaluate, always, at this evaluation statement at the end because this would most likely to be a three marker question. One would be to find out the good things about it, that means the ones that favor it, ones that go against it, and then your evaluation. So this is one mark worth, this just this one line here. So it's very important to write an evaluation statement when it says to evaluate. Now this brings us to the end of the lesson. We covered a few different people and a few different scientists who contributed to the periodic table. We learned how our understanding of the periodic table and elements in them enhanced throughout the years. Thank you.